Friends, as we acknowledge the land this morning, I invite you to join me in taking a moment just to ground here, to slow down a moment. We can allow ourselves to feel how we're anchored on the land. You might even close your eyes and feel your breath. Notice the support of the land and how it's holding us. And we recognize that Indigenous peoples have been serving as stewards of this land for countless generations, thousands of years, long before European settlers came and began colonizing it. And Indigenous communities continue this care for the land, and we're called to join them, responding to the needs of this earth which sustains us. Living out this call, may we inform our words and our actions with the spirit of truth and reconciliation. We're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And we honor in them the light of creation alive and at work in their hearts. And we consider how the light of Christ calls us to create communities of care where we can journey together in gentleness, in truth, and in harmony. Friends, as we open into our gathering hymn this morning, I'll invite you to stand along with the choir, singing together Voices United 230 in your red hymn books in the pew, Heaven is Singing of Joy. Please be seated. <laughs> what a way to start a morning when you're not sure what the day will hold. We welcome you to this time and place. We welcome you no matter how the storm has touched your life. We know there are lots of neighbors around us who haven't had power. We're praying with families who've had loss. In the midst of a short storm, a lot of damage can be done. And so we pay attention to our world and what's called out of us. We pay attention to what's growing in our gardens and how when a day feels dark, there is room for the garden to be watered and fed and for new life to grow. So we invite you to arrive just as you are. Whatever you need, may you find a welcome here. Today is a special day because Carter and Samantha are going to be baptized. And so we are going to light their baptismal lights because today their light shines just a little bit brighter. And they've been waiting for this day of baptism and they've been growing and their families have been praying. And today we join with them to celebrate and we do not forget that today is the sixth Sunday of Easter. It takes a long time to get ready to enter the mystery of Easter, and we're almost close to Pentecost. So I proclaim with you, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
if you haven't been here for a while, it's okay to feel new because everything hold is new again and we're almost starting over together. I've been away for a little while and so some things will feel familiar and some things will feel new. So I invite you just in to, set, to settle in to whatever parts will meet you. When we have baptism, it's our privilege to be part of a bigger community of faith that declares out loud what we believe and we bring our questions and our doubts to that time. And so I invite you to turn in your hymn book to 918 where we'll say together the words of our United Church Creed. And as you say them, I invite you to think about which words are for you this morning, words of hope to proclaim. Let's say those together now. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And so we bring the waters just a little closer inside. We remember that these are the waters of creation. These are the waters that God led the people of God through the Red Sea with Moses. These are the waters of Jesus' baptism, and today, these are the waters of Carter and Samantha's baptism. And I'm going to invite Carter's family to come. Well, James is going to do that for us. Yeah. Islington United Church, I present... Carter Almeida Johnson for baptism. Carter is surrounded by the love of his parents, Ashley and Lennox, his sister Cassidy, his godparents, and family and friends. Carter's name means privileged, and his guiding scripture is Revelation 3, verse 8. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Now, Cassidy, I know we're t reminding you of your baptism today, and after you'll go down to Sunday school with your friends, so to godly play. But Carter, you're all dressed up. Are you ready? I'm going to ask your parents two important questions. Do you believe in God, the creator, source of life and love? Do you believe in Jesus, the one who shows us the way of love and peace? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit who sustains us? If so, please respond, I do by the grace of God. And will you follow in the way of Jesus, who shows us that way to love and serve our neighbor? And will you join with brothers and sisters in this community as we celebrate God's presence and share in God's work? If so, please respond, I will, God being my helper. Now, they've had long nights and lots of waiting, and they need you, Godparents. And so I ask you on this day, will you just share yourselves with Carter? Will you bring your doubts and your faith and walk with him and pray with him as he grows, supporting his parents and Cassidy along the way? If so, please respond, I will, God being my helper. Amen. Church takes a village. I'm going to invite you to stand twice today so you can practice. Here we go. Please stand. You have heard the promises of these parents and godparents, and so I ask, will you commit yourselves to supporting and nurturing them in a family of faith that makes room for them to be themselves, to grow in knowing Jesus, and to be part of a community that loves and serves together in Christ's name? If so, please respond, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. Amen. I know they mean it, so... You may be seated, and I'm going to take Carter. You had a big yawn, so are you ready? Okay, buddy. Carter, I baptize you in the name of God, the Father who created us, in the name of Jesus, the brother, our son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, our friend and sustainer. I mark you with the sign of the cross. I claim you as Christ's own forever. And all the people said... 
Amen. Because we're going to welcome Carter by name so that he'll know who he is. And we'll welcome him in Christ's name so he'll know whose he is. And we'll welcome to you to this family of faith who's making their way at every age and stage. Who will make room for you to run and grow and know who you are. Who will make room to be neighbors and friends. And who will also be bold enough to live that light and love in the world. Sound good? And we'll pray for your parents because we know you'll give them a run for the money some days. <laughs> and they will need God's strength, but they will always have it. Sound good? All right. Carter, this is the day that your light shines just a little bit brighter. Remember that you are a child of God, yes. God filled with the light of Christ. And we're gonna change your light now so that you can take it home with you as a reminder of this day. Right. You want to go sit down? I'm going to ask Samantha to come up. Now she knows Thank what's so going to happen. Good job, Lennox. Love you. Yeah. And on behalf of Islington United Church once more, it's my honor to present Samantha Alexandra Kohut for baptism. Samantha is surrounded by the love of her parents, Tanya and Bodan, her siblings, Victor and Lydia, her godparents and friends and family. The spiritual meaning of Samantha's name is listener, attentive to God's voice. And her guiding scripture is Job 22, verse 28. Whatever you decide to do will be accomplished and light will shine on the road ahead of you. So we bless you, Samantha, and we ask your parents these questions. Do you believe in God, creator, source of life and love? Do you believe in Jesus, the one who shows us the way of love and peace? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, our sustainer? If so, please respond, I do by the grace of God. I do by the grace of God. And will you follow in the way of Jesus, who shows us how to love and serve our neighbor? And will you join with this family of faith as they make their way in this neighborhood to celebrate God's presence and share in God's work? If so, please respond, I will, God being my helper. And God, parents, you know how much they need you. So I ask you, will you bring yourself to loving Samantha? Will you share with her your faith and your questions? And will you pray for her and her parents and her siblings as she grows? If so, please respond, I will, God being my helper. Amen. Okay, church, I invite you one more time. Please stand because these promises are overflowing. You have heard this promise. Samantha, they're standing for you and cheering you on. Will you commit yourselves to supporting and nurturing this family within a community that loves and serves in Christ's name? Will you make space for her to be herself and to grow and to find peace here? If so, please respond. We will with God's help. We will. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, can I take you, honey bun? Hi. I know, I used to suck my thumb too. It was a good, peaceful practice. I baptize you, Samantha, in the name of God, the Father, our Creator, in the name of Jesus, the Brother, our son, the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who will sustain and comfort you. I mark you with the sign of the cross, and I claim you as Christ's own forever. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Samantha, I welcome you by name so that you will know who you are. We welcome you in Christ's name so that you will know whose you are. There are lots of people remembering right now their little ones, and they are blessing you and welcoming you to this time and this family, and you will know that there is a place for you, and people are saying hello and cheering you on and calling you home. And I think the choir has a pretty special blessing for both you and for Carter. Yeah, Samantha, there you go. this is the day that your light shines a little bit brighter. Remember that you are a child of God filled with the light of Christ. And I'll change this light for you now so that you can take it home to remember this day.
Amen. I think the children are going to head out to godly play. And while we do that, I want to acknowledge that the flowers on the communion table are placed, placed in memory of Bricks Caberaban from his family, the Quimno family. So we honor them. And we're, we've lit our memorial lights this morning. And on Wednesday, we said goodbye to Terry Michael Gora and his parents are here, and Patricia and Walter. And so we want to honor that we're holding his light today in worship. And on Friday at 11, we will also have the chance to honor Jane Howell, who many of you know, who's been part of the ministry here at Islington for a long time, and her funeral will be at 11, and there'll be more details to come on the email. So those lights are with us as we step into the story of faith and listen for the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Our first reading today comes from the book of Acts. Listen as Paul responds to God's vision and see how the path opens for him and his friends to share the gospel. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace and following the following day to Neopolis. These are hard names, hard places. <laughs> and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we spoke to a woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyteria and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you. Joy. 
For you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John. Open your heart and listen for the word or phrase that jumps out to you today. Okay. <laughs> Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have sent these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now that I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The word of God for the people of God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Those words Jesus spoke to the disciples and they keep showing up in community. And the book of Acts is all the stories about the community trying to figure out how to be the church, how to follow in the way of Jesus, and how to be disciples. And depending what translation you read that story of Lydia Bo, you will know that she is associated with the color purple. And I did not ask Colleen to dye her hair purple to read that story. <laughs> But there is a humbleness about what we notice and what's associated with that color of royalty and richness. But maybe we take for granted why it is so. So I want to give thanks for Lydia, for she is a curious character. She was the head of her household in that time. She was a business owner. In a time where women were mostly property, in a time where they would never have been invited to read the stories of the people of God in the synagogue. Lydia, a manager of her own business. And purple dyes, well, they were very rare. They were only the best fabrics were chosen to be dyed purple, and only the rich could afford Lydia's beautiful silks and fine linen goods. But there is much life to be gleaned from Lydia. She practiced Sabbath. She did not run her business seven days a week. She would go to fill her emptiness with a few other women in community, meeting in a shady spot by the river to pray. And they shared stories 
of their history and their God and God's work. And they sang the psalms that they knew and offered their prayers to God. Imagine Lydia hearing the good news of Jesus and wondering how to translate and tell others about it. Those she worked with, the dyers working with little tiny shellfish that produced those purple dyes, and all of those workers would have had hands that were stained purple color. They could never get that purple completely washed off. Their work had changed them. And Lydia, she would tell them about how when the liquid spills out of the tiny shellfish that provided the dye, it is clear. And that when the sunlight hits it, anything the liquid has touched instantly becomes a deep, rich purple. And she would tell them that it's like that with God's love. That when the sunlight of the presence of the Spirit touched their lives, they were changed forever. And Lydia she told other stories of Jesus. She spoke of his followers and of the stranger she met on that riverbank of Paul, of the way Jesus treated people and how he loved everyone, and how his disciples taught that in Christ there is no gender or no Jew or Greek or slave or free. We were all beloved of God and recipients of God's grace. And Lydia tried to remember Paul's words and to faithfully pass them on to those who gathered. She experienced God. And she took that story back to Philippi too, for it explained what happens. And it explained what happens in our life. And there's a reason that we light these lights on baptism day, to remind you that even when the sunlight isn't the light that comes close, the presence of the Spirit touches our lives. It meets us whoever and wherever we are, whatever we need. And today, my prayer is that it may open our hearts and invite us to listen in community. And so I invite you to take a moment now to place yourself down by the river, to find yourself listening in community for the presence of God. The sound of a baby's cry, and the note of a familiar song, and the fact that we are here present together in community. I want to remind you that before Lydia heard that good news on the bank of the river, the Apostle Paul had a vision. Visions are not something we talk about easily with each other. 
Visions are not always rational or realistic or make sense. But many people who I've journeyed with talk about having one or two life-changing visions in their lifetime. Others talk about dreams that were directive or real or an idea that they just couldn't shake or a knowing that they were in a thin place in their life when they might have been feeling vulnerable or unsure or needing clarity that opened them to listen differently. In fact, as Christians, we can often be more comfortable hearing or talking about visions when it comes to other spiritual traditions, like an indigenous vision quest, or the images that come in practices of meditation found across faith practices. I wonder if you've ever had a vision from God. I wonder if you've ever asked for a sign or a vision to show you the way. I wonder what would happen if we started to expect and even talk about the experience of receiving a vision. In business circles, we think of the work of vision or mission as mission statement, goals, objectives, deliverables, often measured by financial viability or success or longevity. In family circles, we hear about vision and we think of a dream or a plan for our family. Some families have even crafted a statement about what their vision is for their family and they place it on their walls or hang it in a frame in their home. Some examples I've heard from families are um, keep moving forward or may your first word be adventure and your last word be love or we will wisely use our time, our talent, and our treasure to bless others. You may not have it so clearly and poetically, but you know when you bump up against in your family when it feels like this is what our family does and this is not what our family does. That's what we use in our house sometimes. In church, we hear vision and we think, Step by step, one, we'll pray about it. Two, we'll thank God for working in our congregation and our lives. Three, we'll make a strategic plan by discerning God's vision for us. We might call a consultant to walk with us and pray with us. But scripting a vision is much different than receiving a vision from God. Receiving a vision from God is very common in our scriptures. In each story, God is trying to catch our attention and transform us. This transformation can often be painful and difficult as we watch the people of God go through different challenges, as we see the disciples being tested on their journey. It may seem to come just as easy as going down to the river to pray. Maybe this is why we like logical planning steps to name God's vision because it can almost give us a false sense of control. We can get caught in the false idea that God is predictable and controllable. Remember, Paul used to be Saul, the Christian hater, until he was visited by Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his experience stopped him bold, stead in his tracks, enough that he changed direction completely He changed his name and his identity, and he followed in a different way. The many twists and turns along the Spirit-led route bring Paul to Europe for the first time. This story that Colleen reads to us actually is rooted in the reason we're gathering this morning as people of faith, as Paul took a circuitous route, listening to God's visions of where he should go. In fact, this one vision connects to a big journey, we might say. Now, if you (laughs) grew up in a family that likes board games, you might have had a few board games that can, the game of life. There's some games that kind of mimic our life a little bit we like to play with. In the double minister's house that I grew up in, we had the board game, The Adventures of Paul. I know, very exciting. We should maybe pull it out. We could play it later today. Jason and James, I don't know if you know about this one. But the thing about the board game about The Adventures of Paul is when you pull it out and look at it, you see the map and you see all of these crazy routes that he took along the way of just 
receiving invitations to help people. And so it's probably why I love this story, because it's not a one-time experience. It's not a one-way ticket. It's not a straight path. In fact, over and over and over, every time Paul made a plan and invited people on the way, there was a different vision that changed the direction. And the only lesson he had to realize along the way is that you cannot prepare to receive a vision, but you must stay close to the one who is the vision. That's all I yearn for you to pay attention, not only this week and this day, we make all the best laid plans, but the invitation of our ancient story is to stay close to the one who is the vision. So how do you know if it's a vision? Well, here are a couple of things. A vision is forward-looking, and it's not doomsday or predictive of bad things happening. Do you hear that? So you can kind of test it. Is this a vision? Is this a vision? It's an invitation to hope or a new thing. Sometimes it's a wake-up call. It's always an experience of God. It's not a bad dream or a nightmare. For many of us who don't sleep well in night, our mind can play tricks on us, and there can be a sense that we could get confused in the fatigue. And lastly, a vision is not a predictor of the future. Paul's vision was that there's a man in Macedonia who needs help and is asking for him to come. And that man doesn't even show up in the story. The invitation of that man leads them and the friends. Remember, because Paul didn't just wake up and pack his bags. He checked it out with his friends who were on the journey with him. He stepped into that adventure. He was open to God guiding them, and then it led them, I am sure they were surprised, to Lydia on the bank of a river. And it was there at the riverside where Lydia welcomed a stranger and became a disciple. It was there that Lydia found the God who was finding her. And longing and grace met there on the bank of the river. The longing heart of a woman who had been faithful and prayed and who was opened by the gracious impulse of a faith-giving God. Long before Lydia met Paul on the bank of a river, God had already started speaking to her through prayer and worship. Lydia created community, and God opened her heart to listen eagerly. We all have longing in our hearts. We all need God's grace and community. And we are invited to stay close to the one who is with us, the one who will open our hearts to know that we can help and be helped. There's a danger into thinking you're on one side or the other because giving and receiving go hand in hand. This God who invites us to help and be help will lead us to unexpected places. Yesterday at 3.30, we did a wedding here. Um, It was a second marriage for both of the couple, and um, they had lost their parents. We lit memorial lights. Their parents had died uh, long ago. And they told me a story how through the pandemic in the building that they live in, they became friends with their neighbor across the hall named Lucille. She's 90 years old. And through the two years of helping each other, they would play together, play cards, and they would share community together. They became family. They were both helped and helped in return. And Lucille sat in the kind of position of honor. We put the parents often in the front row at the wedding, and I was reminded how um, easily the script can be changed of who our family is and who we care for and who cares for us and how our hearts can be open by being in relationship. We all have a longing in our hearts and a need for God's grace and for community. 
we need to stay close to the one who's with us, the one who will open our hearts to how we can help and be helped. In this moment, right now, this moment of worship and prayer is a way to have our hearts opened over and over and over. It has led to transformative action that embodies that good news and grows community. Out of this practice of prayer and worship, the Maybell, whoa, something amazing is going to be born now, I feel. Out of this moment and action of prayer and worship, a vision of the Maybell Food Program was born, a gathering in community to welcome newcomers to Canada for refugee support was born, the Go Project was born, an open door policy for weddings in a time when people were being turned away, the choice to become an affirming congregation, the spark for planting the giving garden to feed the neighborhood, out of prayer and worship, grieving and celebrating calls us into relationship. And it connects us to each other when we forget that we all have a need to help and be helped to draw close to the one who does that for us. So I give thanks to Lydia for taking time to rest and pray and sing, for welcoming the stranger and having much conversation with Paul. I'm sure he learned from her as well. For Lydia, who it's hard for us to imagine even saying lately in pandemic times, Come to my house. Come over for dinner. Let's be in relationship and know each other. We will find our vision in relationship with God. And we will know our vision in relationship with each other. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's continue with our hearts connected in prayer. God of love, listen to your children praying, gathered down by the river. We thank you for the ways you guide us and for the peace you give us. We thank you that your peace and your guidance are present even in the midst of struggle 
trouble and suffering. We thank you for the longing in our hearts, stretching us and calling us to your presence. Help us to attune to the movement of your spirit, God. And help us to honor the ways that it guides us. Aware of many ways that you journey with us, God, may we be inspired to live with open and trusting hearts, leaning into your peace and guidance with courage and confidence. Both individually and collectively, we pray that you would grant us a vision and give us the strength and flexibility to follow that guidance, to follow your light. When the loud voices of the world try to draw us into greed, fear, violence, we pray that you would steady us with your still, small voice. And as we learn to recognize our own vision, our own power, and our own abundance, God, help us to become generous vessels of healing and peace in this world, sharing our love, sharing our resources with all in our spheres of care, with all those who are struggling. And as we do this, following in Jesus' way, may our lives be rooted in love and understanding, praying together as he teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue to be called to be the Easter people, and I want to thank all of those who have contributed their stories in these last few weeks about the work of Islington that has helped them to be an Easter people. Mark Aitchison wrote about being open to joy, and Wendy Sexsmith talked to us about living into gratitude, and Greg shared with us about offering welcome to all. Amy Crawford challenged us to embrace wonder, and Colleen named the importance of releasing fear. We are called to be an Easter people, and hallelujah is our song. We are involved in the spiritual practice of giving. And this community has responded to date. We've raised $12,000 in our Easter work, and our goal was $15,000. But as we've learned from Lydia, anything is possible. So we invite you to be part of that Called to Be Easter people. There are envelopes around the church, and there's lots of ways uh, to give e-transferring to office at islingtonunited.org um, or mailing in an offering. But mid the traffic and the noise we continue to lean into God's generosity and abundance.
Don't you just want to stay there a little longer in a bit of peace? It's hard to believe that next week will be Music Sunday, will be the last Sunday of Easter and the last Sunday that we're in the sanctuary as it will be painted um, over the next couple of months. So we will be moving to the Stuart East Hall and engaging in worship together there. So we look forward to that experience and we're prayerful for all of the workers who will be um, readying it for our next season of ministry. We have one more wedding this afternoon, so we're also praying for that couple at 2 o'clock. We've got a couple of um, birthdays that we want to remember. Glenn Hambrook is turning 70 today, so we want to really honor and celebrate his birthday. And Marlo Conforzi, Joe and Jen's little girl, she turns four on Monday. And Stephen Aitchison, who many of you can remember as four, is turning 37 on Tuesday, so we're sending love to him in BC. Peter Lindsay has a birthday on Wednesday. On Thursday, Ramona and Alan Corbelan, I can't believe it, is 22 years old. And Naomi Fraser is 23 on Friday. So we're just holding lots of birthdays. Alina and Kelly share that birthday with Naomi. And on Saturday, Rick Summercamp has a birthday. And Adam Vandervliet is turning nine. And Janet Wells has a birthday too. So, um, And on Friday night of this week at 8 o'clock, there's an open meeting for AA. And our Paul Stewart will be receiving his 30-year sobriety medallion. So, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the journeys of Paul. He has many good stories for us. So we give thanks for him, and everybody is welcome to come and celebrate with him at 8 o'clock on Friday. I also want to welcome, Lynn LeBlanc has arrived um, with the family that we have been praying for. And Rasha, you are here with your children this morning in worship at your own request to be with us. And so I welcome you from the bottom of my heart. And I am grateful to also welcome Nahum and Muhammad and Leila and Iyad and Naya. And so we hope that you will feel part of this neighborhood and this community and know um, that we're here to support and encourage your family as you grow. So I know they're right here. We just want to welcome them. So there is much good news in the midst of all of our journeys. I don't think I forgot anything, except that you may not be tracking that I was away for three months and James held um, that role for me. And he is setting off on an adventure on Tuesday evening. He will be flying um, and he will be pilgrimaging and praying and reuniting with friends. And he will be away from our community for the next three months. So it is my privilege right now to bless you into that next journey. And we wish we had a little map of where, but you have taught us about being open to what the Spirit is saying. So I'm going to ask you to come beside me. God, we have been grateful to be in community in person together in this ministry with James. We are also grateful for the ways that he journeys away and returns, having drawn closer to you and to the knowing of how to help and be of service in your world. May he, like Lydia, be open-hearted and hear your words guiding and following in that way in the months to come. Know that his home and heart will be connected to us as we cheer him on and pray him on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The closing hymn is Today We All Are Called to Be, Voices United 507. And we're learning to figure out what discipleship looks like for each of us. So may this call us to be a bold community together.
So go from this place surrounded by the unconditional love of God and following in the way of the one who strengthens you. And may the Spirit guide you, finding you circuitously navigating the journey of life, surrounded by God's peace. And all the people said, Amen.